Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we're going to be looking at when gear and equipment can throw off your tabletop RPG's power levels or your game balance in ways that you might not want or you might not just be ready for yet. You know, such as you have your street level cyberpunk game with characters that are in light Kevlar shirts and jackets and they're sporting pistols or melee weapons, but then all of a sudden one or more player characters come strolling in in cyborg power armor and rail guns, and now the bad guys that are appropriate for the rest of the group can't possibly touch this player character and they stand zero chance against them, meaning that there's no longer any challenge for this player character, and now a lot less challenge for the rest of the players. So now, of course, the Game Master, you're bringing in more and more powerful bad guys, and all the player characters are going to start beefing themselves up in response to this, and now the game is going in a you know, different direction that not everybody is happy with. Now, normally I do these types of videos as very system neutral, applicable to any game from Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, Aliens, Cult Divinity Lost, or whatever else, all equally, but this video is a bit more specialized than that. And while this is certainly going to be useful for any game, this video is more focused towards skill-based games where there's no character levels or increased hit points, and the biggest influence on a character's damage output and their ability to take damage is really just the equipment that that character has. You know, where a single attack by a faceless goon can take out half or more of a character's maximum hit points. Not a powerful goon, just a random guy that's got a rifle or a shotgun doing average damage. And this is something that I've encountered a lot of questions and comments about in different forums or just on my own videos. You know, something that you might have in Call of Cthulhu, but this mostly seems to be an issue in science fiction games, namely Cyberpunk and Traveler being the games that I've encountered those questions the most on because I talk about those games quite a bit. So those are the types of games that I'm really going to be focusing on with this video. Okay, so disclaimers out of the way, let's get this thing started. Many sci-fi games come with lists of available equipment, you know, all kinds of cool gear that the player characters can purchase. There's even more that appears in different expansion books you can pick up. My first real encounter with this was in Cyberpunk 2020, where we had Chromebooks 1 through 4, and then Blackhand Street Weapons, or the big book of guns that we like to call it as we pass that around the table. The current edition of Cyberpunk Red now has their Black Chrome expansion book carrying on that tradition. Traveler, which also comes with a ton of powerful gear in the core book, offers us the Central Supply Catalog expansion, which gives us a ton of armor, weapons, cybernetic augments, and really cool equipment. And with all of these games, well, some of that gear might be rare or expensive or military only and just hard to come by, a lot of common and inexpensive equipment is still very, very powerful and very easy to find for cheap. Or at least it's going to be common and inexpensive in a normal game world. A Game Master, of course, you can set the game you know, somewhere where it's yeah, normally that normally available equipment and everyday things are going to be harder to come by. You know, Various laws or supply chain issues might get in the way and the prices might raise on those few goods that are still available, but for the most part, these are all regularly available goods. And nothing's really stopping the player characters from just going out and picking up some of the more powerful weapons and armors and just doing a lot of damage with that or being able to take a lot of damage with it. However, if you are wanting your game to not immediately vault into powerful characters strolling around in power armor and one-shotting tanks, there's a few ways that you can do that. The first is just simply talking to your group. Now this can be a session zero conversation before the actual start of the campaign, where everyone around the table agrees that such power climbs are either not going to be part of the game altogether, or just going to increase very slowly over the course of several adventures, allowing everyone to enjoy that gradual rise. Now this is something that my table refers to as escalation, and the escalation conversation isn't as much of a session zero conversation that I have before the campaign starts, but a regular discussion that we just have around the table periodically. And what escalation means is it's a simple agreement that I, as the Game Master, will throw opponents against my player characters who are powerful enough to pose a dangerous threat, but not so powerful that they can effortlessly wipe out the player characters and just curb stomp them. Essentially, that my players are the ones who are going to be setting the game's power level because I'm merely reacting to how powerful they are. For example, and the incident that really caused me to first begin this conversation with my group many years ago, was we we were playing Cyberpunk 2020, and I had this kill squad of bad guys storm the building that the player characters were all inside of, and they had medium SMGs, probably 9mm, and that does 2d6 plus 1 damage. 
Now, one of the player characters had been beefing up his character's armor, and when a bad guy shot him on full auto, I realized that the character's armor was higher than the bullets could even do. Head to toe, the character had 14 or 15 points of damage against my 13 points maximum damage that I could do with this gun, turning these bad guys who were meant to be a threat into a complete non-threat for this player character. So the next encounter we had, I made a few upgrades to those bad guys. Some started carrying more powerful guns or started carrying armor-piercing ammo. You know, maybe they had a couple grenades among them. Now the players noticed this, and most of the players weren't as armored as that one player had been. The early encounter had still posed a bit of a threat to them, but now the bad guys at their encounter were more threatening to everybody around the table, so I had to explain that I was merely responding to their increase in power level. Now, this isn't any sort of retaliation. I'm not trying to punish my players or anything. I didn't have a problem with their upgrading their armor. It was simply the game balance needed adjusting in order to keep the games challenging for everybody. Now, this is a bit for your average goons. Big bosses, they're usually going to be a bit higher as far as damage output and armor soak anyways. But as the campaign progresses, the average bad guy or average goon, they start getting a little bit tougher and a little bit deadlier whenever the player characters encounter them. It's no different than in D&D. If your player characters and they reach 7th level, you're going to start using tougher opponents than when those player characters were 2nd level. Now, of course, there is a bit of metagaming with this. The players, if they want to keep their game's power level low, or at least slow down the power creep that might happen, then that's going to be their choice as far as how fast the power creep happens, because you are putting this in their control. So I was thinking that my character's got enough money to get himself a combat suit, which gets 17 points of armor. Awesome. Just remember Escalation, man, so you might be facing more laser rifles and gauss weapons going forward. Huh. Yeah, that's worth it. Cool. Then let's do it. Now, one thing that game masters and players should understand is that escalation is going to happen. It just is. If a game master gives their bad guys some great equipment, then either the player characters, they're going to you know count, try to counteract that by getting their own beefy equipment before they encounter the bad guys in order to take that bad guy out, or they're simply going to pick up that sweet equipment off the floor once they do take out that bad guy and the fight is done. So always keep in mind that you don't, if you don't want your player characters to be running around with auto cannons, you know, not quite just yet then you shouldn't be giving auto cannons to your bad guys because that's how the player characters are going to get them. Or don't armor your bad guys to the point that the player characters have to get heavier and heavier weapons just in order to fight them. Because if you are armoring your bad guys that much and the player characters are getting beefier weapons just to be able to hurt your bad guys, you can't get mad that the player characters are getting beefier weapons because you're the one that gave them those bad guys. And if you don't want the PCs to be getting bigger and better armor to the point that most small arms can't even scratch them anymore, then your bad guys need to be using weapons that are weak enough that the player character's armor can effectively stop most of the damage that those bad guys are trying to do to them. You know, try to keep the player characters feeling that their current armor values are sufficient and that they don't need to upgrade. You know, definitely keep enough bad guys that are weak enough that the player characters can also enjoy just dominating them. You know, a little reminder to how powerful the player characters are, but you still want to make them feel that there is a threat, but you don't want to make it feel too threatening. That way they don't ha feel that they have to upgrade upgrade. Another thing to remember is no matter how powerful and awesome the player characters become, there will always be a bigger foe. If they have a badass warship, the NPCs can pull in a bigger warship or a whole fleet of warships. In Cyberpunk, the player characters might be able to take down a squad or a base of Arasaka soldiers, but they're never going to outgun Arasaka itself. Game masters have infinite lives and infinite resources. You know, some years ago I read a review for one of the Cyberpunk equipment guides, and they were complaining how there were things in there that were just too powerful or too expensive or too weird to be offering the player characters, and that was their biggest criticism of the book, is why would you be offering all these things to the PCs? And one example that they named was the Punk Knot, essentially a flying killdozer cobbled together out of various destroyed vehicles. The newest edition of the game even offers them still, but the part that that reviewer didn't understand about you know, all those overpowered, expensive, or just outright weird equipment, is that it is, it's because it's not intended for the player characters to buy. It's for the game masters to use as obstacles against the player characters. And the fact that the players get to outfit themselves with some of that cool equipment, that's a valuable but secondary purpose. However, one very powerful tool that game masters can use, or at least enforce, is simply because the player characters have that amazing armor, amazing weapons, doesn't mean that they're always carrying that on them, or at least not carrying that on them without some sort of cost for having it. Now, there can be legal reasons for this. If they try to stroll through the front doors of that 
corporate building or that secured city, they might not be allowed inside by the police or private security. Kind of like in Beyond Thunderdome, Max has to turn in all his weapons before they'll let him safely into Barter Town. Or that bar in Serenity where they had to secure their weapons and lockers before they were allowed inside. So even if the law level of the world has no issues with the player characters strolling around with weapons and combat armor, that doesn't mean that all of the world equally is like that. Even in a fantasy setting, a random group of heroes probably isn't going to be allowed to carry their weapons or armor into the king's throne room because that's going to be a threat to the king. Even in ancient Rome, a civilization known for its violent conquests and gladiatorial games, you couldn't walk around the city of Rome with a sword at your hip. You know, war was something that was supposed to happen outside the city walls, so swords were banned inside the city. And even if the player characters are allowed to stroll around town just fully armed and armored, that doesn't mean that the police aren't going to take notice of them, wonder what nefarious things this group of armored people is up to, follow them around, harass them, or simply just make up an excuse to arrest them. There's also social consequences. If the player characters stroll into a bar in full battle rattle, people might not be too comfortable talking to them. This can cause some difficulty trying to charm or mingle and kind of get the lay of the land if everybody's kind of intimidated by this heavily armed and armored character. On the Traveler forums a few months back, one game master was complaining how one of his players had a really great vac suit that he owned. It had great armor protection on it, and that player insisted on wearing that vac suit everywhere all the time. And the game master was asking for advice from the forum on how to get this player character to stop always wearing their space suit when they were planet side, trying to come up with new mechanical effects, making the space suit suddenly too bulky to walk around with, or just ruin the seals if it spends too much time in atmosphere. No actual reason behind either of those. But the answer isn't to make up new rules to force the players into submission, but simply show how people are going to react to a guy walking around a public park or subway train in a freaking space suit. It's like in Back to the Future when they're making fun of Marty's vest, you know, thinking that it was a life preserver. Imagine going to a restaurant one day and seeing a person in a scuba suit just sitting in a booth over there. At best we'd think that that person was a weirdo. At worst we'd think that maybe that person knows something that we don't know. Because why are they wearing a scuba outfit? Is there something bad about to happen today? Are we about to be underwater here? Or you can have somebody ID somebody walking around in a spacesuit as being an off-worlder tourist, right? Because if they weren't an off-worlder, why would they have a spacesuit to begin with? So that means that criminals or different people might try to take advantage of or rob them, right? It's just putting a big old target on their chest that says, tourist, I got money and I don't know what's going on. Now, one thing that I do need to mention here is so far we've only talked about dressing for the occasion in terms of dressing down, removing some of the player character's equipment. But that's that's dressing down for the from the player character's average daily loadout, sort of what their everyday adventuring wear is. But it should also work the other way from time to time. You know, if walking around in a civilized city or going to go watch a baseball game somewhere means that they probably shouldn't wear their combat armor and rifle, then when the player characters and they're going into a place that they know is going to be hard hostile and dangerous, they should also dress up for that. This is when they might pull out that face shield or go fetch the shotguns and rifles out of the trunk. They know that they're entering the lion's den and preparing for it. I don't consider this to be escalation on the part of the players. They're not really increasing the power level of the game here. It's just the game master is increasing it and the player characters are gearing up to match it for this moment. I'm perfectly fine with the player characters having a bunch of heavier equipment stored in the trunk of their car or back home at their base of operations and running back and getting that when the action surprises them, or if they know that they're going to be in trouble and they're going to be entering a hostile situation, just suiting up for that in advance. Anyway, that's my thoughts on handling powerful gear in skill-based games. A lot of game masters that are coming over from level-based games like D&D, where it's just far easier to control and see whatever the power level of the player characters is, it's a lot easier to judge their power scale, they can find it a bit jarring at first when they come over to these types of games, and I and several of my friends, we certainly did when we first made that move, and a lot of game masters, they then make the mistake of trying to control all of that, making what should be available equipment just impossible to get for no good reason, or making up mechanical effects in order to punish the players for overstepping the threshold of what the game master thinks is appropriate for their game. But I found it just a lot easier to talk it out, explain what escalation is and how that works, and then use the in-game you know, legal and social obstacles in order to kind of control what the player 
player characters are doing all the time. That they don't just have one outfit that they wear everywhere depending on whatever that is. And it kind of shows the consequences but also creates some risks and fun opportunities for the player characters to conceal or smuggle weapons and armor. And it adds that risk or tension when the player characters do enter a situation where they don't have their best equipment on them at that time and they have to adapt and figure out what to do in order to overcome this obstacle. And one fun aspect of equipment centric games is that gear is regularly changing for the situation, right? They suit up for whatever the situation is and it's not just one outfit all the time, making the game not just one power level all the time. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or RPG philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. And if you want to support Seth's channel, consider picking up a set of his RPG icons dice through Q Workshop. They're pretty sweet. Till next time, amigos, stay awesome. You know, for a guy that always acts like escalation is caused by the players, you're the game master that gave all of us power armor for no real reason in the mystery of BTSHT365, and then you had to scramble and panic because you had done that, and then you had to beef up the bad guys in response. Sounds like you're really just projecting a personal problem, dude.